So Niall, welcome. I hear you're in Portugal. What are you up to over there? I am in the Algarve. I'm in Villa Mora, which, is, uh, which isn't too bad at all. I'm, I'm overwriting the second series of my podcast, Whereas, Where's My Mind? Um, I kind of made the excuse that I had to come to the sun to do that because you couldn't possibly write in Dublin. So off I came here. And I haven't got a lot of work done, to be honest, but uh, I've got a lot of sunbathing and a lot of um, sightseeing. So that's really why I'm here, probably. Fantastic. And actually, I, I have a podcast. Maybe I should go to Villa Mora to prepare my podcast. I'm going to put that in the diary. I think it's a great idea. So listen, there's so much to talk to you about. You've done so much. Um, let's go back to childhood. What did you want to be when you were a child? What, were the, what was the vision? What was the dream? Um, I grew up in a small kind of town in the middle of Ireland called Mullingar. And um, it was, I was one of those towns that like, there was a lot of access to sport. There was a lot of access to music. And I always had this kind of, my mum's a music teacher, my father's army officer. So my, my dad loved sport. My mum loved music. And I was kind of somebody who was caught between two of them. And uh, I was a big guy, I was a big kid. So obviously sport became a big part of my life growing up. Um, every sport from football to Gaelic football, to hurling, to rugby, to tennis, to golf, to everything. And I had very supportive parents uh, who kind of said, listen, find the sport you like and go for it. But the one thing that kept pulling for me when I was growing up was music. Um, there was always mu music in my house. Um, and as much as I loved sport, music always had that extra pull. So that's what was me joining bands, joining teams. It was a very kind of interactive childhood um, in a town where I was lucky enough that there was access to these things. It's interesting because I was going to ask you which is the one that is the biggest passion and you've, you've answered that, you said it, it is the music, but, but you were very successful as an athlete as well. How can you have success in two very different areas? How do you do that? Um, I think there's, there's this kind of mentality with the world generally that if you do one thing, you can't do another thing, especially if they don't perfectly align like music and sport. And even when I was a professional athlete, a lot of people were like, you couldn't possibly be a musician as well. And like, like who, who made that rule up? Why do we have these rules? And especially young people have these rules where it's kind of they have to conform to a certain aspect of what they do. And I never wanted to do that. My parents never made me do that. So for me, it did require the same mindset. Uh, becoming a professional athlete, um, it requires mindset and requires support. It requires luck. It requires athletic ability uh, but with music it's the same thing you 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 have to acquire the same mindset if you want to be successful at music it is a difficult industry so uh, getting into professional sport was difficult especially because uh, I, I ended up being a professional rugby player and where I'm from rugby isn't a sport uh, rugby in Ireland is generally schools uh, generally private schools I didn't go to a private school I went to a public school called St Mary's where it was Gaelic football. And if you played rugby and it was seen as a, a non-Irish sport, the teachers would look down on you. So for me to play rugby was, a, was, a, was almost treason in my school. Um, but I loved it. And I was a big guy and very quickly uh, fell into professional sport and played for Leinster and played underage for Ireland. And that was the kind of role I went on. And do you still um, participate in any sports? Do you still keep fit? Oh, you look fit. I mean, clearly you're very busy. You're performing on stage. But how do you keep fit these days? Uh, fitness fitness is, a, is an incredibly important part of my life. But something I will say is when you get to kind of your 30s and uh, hitting on to your 40s, fitness can become quite obsessive for people. Um, and they can start using fitness and training as something that they're running from something they don't want to deal with, like stress. Or some people use overworking, some people use different obsessive behaviors. But I've noticed in the last couple of years in the sport that I moved into, which was triathlon, um, I started kind of partaking in Ironman. And I actually actively, almost like sociological experiments, was, was noticing that people training became so obsessed with it that they couldn't see the world outside what they were doing. Even though in my head, I was doing this because it was good for my head. It was good to have a purpose that was outside work. Um, so yeah, I think with sport for me, it's now, it's, I've redefined what it does in my life. And what it does in my life is it gives me a purpose, as I said, outside a uh, career. And it also allows me to interact. And that's a really important part. Uh, a lot of my work is very remote and very, it's very alone stuff. You do a lot of writing. So it's important for me to be around people um, and whether that's 
uh, on a bike with a, with, a, with a few people going for a long cycle or it's a run. I need to be around people. I like people. I like interacting. So yeah, it's important to point that out, I think. Fantastic. And so with your, going back to your music, um, you were very successful on The Voice of Ireland. You, I believe you won twice um, as coach. Is that right? Three times. Three times. Apologies. Snuck, you won. snuck in at the end. You snuck in at three yeah. times. Fantastic. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, I mean, you're very competitive, obviously. We, we've gathered that. But The Voice of Ireland, something happened, didn't it, during that show, uh, during filming that changed everything for you. Can, can you tell us that story and what happened? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I, I, for years, have, I was diagnosed with general anxiety disorder and panic disorder in my 20s, which was kind of a funny thing when you, when we use the stereotypes that we so often associate with uh, mental health in the world, we always associate that only certain types of people can be affected by a, a professional athlete, absolutely couldn't be. But actually, the reality is, having worked with athletes for many years now, they're the most affected by issues like this, because no one's ever, ever taught them how to deal with adversity, injury, failure. and emotional intelligence isn't part of, of their training. And in my case, um, I, I used to suffer quite severely with panic attacks. And when I got offered the, the show, The Voice, all that went through my head for the whole period of signing the contract was I will have a panic attack on live television. And I could not get this out of my head. And many, many people have panic attacks. They're very normal. Um, and I've spent many years studying them. Um, but in this case, when you keep telling your brain something's going to happen from a neurological point of view, that's generally what, what happens. And that works two ways. It can, it can be positive, too. But in my case, I, I talked myself into a pretty severe panic attack. Um, and it was the third live show of the first series of The Voice. And it was quarter past six. And we were on there at half six. And our stage manager was knocking on the door. And behind the door, I was vomiting. I couldn't catch my breath. I was viciously shaking. There was tears flooding from my eyes. I was in the midst of probably the worst panic attack I've ever had. And uh, what felt like an hour, which was about 60 seconds, and I stood up and looked in the mirror and I went, it's over now, I can't hide this. Uh, I've been hiding this for 15 years and now I have to go on television. And uh, I always say men wear makeup and television for the shine. Um, and I looked like my face looked distorted. Uh, my eyes were blood red uh, from tears. And I could see my heart coming out my chest. It was quite a severe panic attack. But at that point, I had no choice. I had to go out on television. I couldn't, I couldn't not go out. And I went through the 90 minutes of the show and I, I just tried to get my breath together. I actually started singing a Tom Waits song in my head to distract myself, a song called Martha. Kept singing it and kept singing it. Show finished went back to my hotel and that was it then. I, I, I made the decision then that I was no longer going to let this have that level of control over me. Um, but the first decision I had to make was I had to tell people about it because all my energy was used to disguise it. Uh, and anyone who's gone through it realized that your energy needs to go into dealing with it, not disguising it. So that night, the next day, I told my colleagues, my friends, and over, over a couple of weeks, I then started to speak publicly about it. And that was the kind of, that was a shift. That was a huge shift. Um, when we spoke previously, you said that you were just inundated, weren't you, with messages from people saying that, how, how pleased they were that somebody of your success and stature and renown had actually said, you know, I'm suffering from this. And, and, and that's led you to do other things in that area, hasn't it? Absolutely. And I think it's important also to point out that we have this really, really, not dangerous, but lazy language around mental health uh, that, that it, it, apparently it's some character flaw that stops you being successful. Or stop. Actually, the most successful, most interesting, most creative, most artistic people I know are people who struggle with their minds. Um, we, it's not our fault. It's the conditioning that we've had for generations and you know, our schooling, our education, and we've never dealt with this. Um, so we can't expect it to just shift overnight. But in my case, the language around it, and if you look to America, some of the language around after the, you know, the tragedies and mass shootings, very quickly that turns to mental health. That's very damaging. And I don't think the people saying it have true realization. It doesn't damage me because I'm a mature adult who understands that there's agendas behind everything we hear. But the, the vulnerable 15 year old in their, in their bedroom who wants to talk to their parents for the first time, it affects them. And that's the work that I do. And one of the things that um, after speaking about my own journey uh, publicly that happened, I didn't realize how many people it affected. Uh, it, became, it became overwhelming, if I'm being honest, because 
thousands of people started contacting me and I didn't know what to do or how to hold that. So I started a blog called My 1000 Hours um, and people then started to want to write on the blog. But that overwhelmed me too because I just didn't have the resources. I was on my own here. So I started an organization called The Lust for Life um, and that's now a charity. It's one of the top advocacy charities in mental health in Ireland. We work uh, across with the EU and government in terms of policy and um, and lobbying in that area. So it's funny how these things work and how fast they move. Back then, five years ago, six years ago, I know we're talking a lot about mental health now. We really still weren't talking about it back then. It still was that stigmatized and it still is stigmatized, um, especially in the workplace because we create this kind of wellness weeks, which are great and they're creating awareness, but are they creating change? Are they giving people the ability to deal with stress? And also we need to reframe stress. Stress is not a bad thing. It's essential. It gets us up in the morning. It motivates us and it keeps us alive. Um, so it's about redefining language and redefining how we look at this because we've also created this positivity, cult positivity, where we all have to be positive all the time. That's not real. That is not real life. And our brains have not been designed that way. So we have to be honest with each other around this. That, that's fascinating. And that's really interesting to hear because of a different view from, from what I've heard actually around this topic, which is refreshing. The other thing you say when we talked before, you say that often people talk about mental health and they don't go far enough. And sometimes they talk about mental health and they go too far. And that in itself is damaging. How, why does that become damaging for an, an audience if somebody's talking about mental health, for example, as a speaker? Well, as a speaker, it's very, very important to recognize one thing, first and foremost, that rule one is your audience. Uh, secondly, the way I speak about mental health, I'm quite open and transparent and incredibly honest about it. So if somebody's in that audience who might be in a, a bit of an issue themselves or are, are having an issue at home or something, it's important in my, from, from a duty of care perspective, that there's, there's capacity for that person to get access to support immediately if they need it. Um, I've spoken in schools, universities, and, and you name, from every level of corporate, from tech to legal to accountancy. And within the corporate sector, luckily, there's generally good programs like the EAP and support systems if somebody does find it difficult uh, or, or finds it slightly distressing, whereas in schools there generally isn't. So in my case, I have to tailor what I say and how I say it. Now, I don't say uh, things for the sake of it. I tell a story that's very honest and has impact, but I also tell it from an expert level as well uh, of, of, I suppose, spending many years studying the area. But people who don't go far enough then I think sometimes we can we can belittle how difficult this can be for people and um, and for example anxiety is not an anxiety disorder uh, stress is not anxiety having a few crap days isn't depression and we have to really get into the idea of the clinical aspects so there's clinical aspects of mental health and then there's the everyday aspects where people just have a terrible few days a bit overwhelmed a bit stressed we all feel that every human being on earth feels that um, and anxiety disorder stops you functioning. It, it can really dictate your careers, your relationships, and, and it can be really difficult. And if we talk about anxiety as just being stressed every now and again, it kind of takes away from the, the difficulty of a, of a difficult anxiety or panic disorder or depression or the other varying degrees of mental health issues. So it, for me, it's important that we, we don't stop this awareness. We bring this awareness on. It's fantastic. It's amazing. It's so positive. But the problem with that is that we're not creating systems of support to go along with it. Our, our access to support isn't there. Access to good psychology and psychotherapy. Uh, we, we've very much got a medical model that kind of first, the first preference is always medication, which medication is absolutely required in some cases. But if a 15 year old's experiencing anxiety for the first time, I would love them to be able to get access to good psychology and good psychotherapy first and talk therapy but access to that is not forthcoming in especially in Ireland um, and I know quite a bit about the NHS as well which is a which is a far better system than we have here with the HSC but it's still not a perfect system and in Ireland for example of our entire health budget our entire health budget we spend six percent on mental health six whereas the World Health Organization says a minimum of 13 and I think in the UK, it's about 12 or 13%. So that will show you in Ireland where we are from a policy point of view. 
Yeah, that's fascinating. And, it, and you're so right that it, it, we need to have more support. Do you think if you'd had that support when you were a 15 year old and you were going through your first or you said actually it was your 20s, wasn't it, that you were going through your first anxiety attacks, would that have made a difference to you? Would you be a different person today, do you think? Yes. Absolutely. Um, and now it's important to also point out that when I started my journey with therapy, um, I went through different therapists. I didn't click with a couple of them. That is, it's like anything. It's like if you went to physio and you didn't really like your physio, you're not going to keep going to that physiotherapist. With, with something like psychotherapy or psychology, you, need, you, need to be even, you don't need to be best friends. You don't need to be hugging them and high-fiving them. But there has to be something between you. And for me, I started with cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, um, and then I moved into things like um, Gestalt psychology. And then ultimately, I've been practicing mindfulness, which is where I went and did my master's in the end and mindfulness based interventions. So there's many different types of therapy. And that's the other thing we got to do here. I have a friend who I asked, what do you think therapy is? And he goes, is that when people show you pictures and you say what you see? And I went, well, no, that's part of it. And if you're at that level, you're a bit further on than I thought you were. And um, therapy is like having that friend you can tell all your crap to but you don't have to listen to any of their crap. It's, it is, it's essential that we create access to it. It, it, it works um, and it's really helpful. And if I had had it, first thing I would have realized is that what I'm dealing with is quite normal. Secondly, um, I would have realized it's not really my fault. You know, I, I've been brought up in a society that just hasn't let anybody show emotion or be human because that's the, what this is. And in 20 years when robots are doing everybody's jobs, this is the one thing we have over them is emotion. So why don't we learn to be better at it and understand it a bit more? And, and that's where my passion lies. And I imagine it's probably higher, harder, sorry, being male, because a man is supposed to be, in inverted commas, strong um, and less emotional. Whereas we women, we can be a little bit hysterical. Um, we can blame our hormones. But I imagine in a man's world, especially a man who's a, a tall man, a big man, as you said, in an athletic world, uh, environment when you were younger that must have been so hard for you to, to be in yeah i think it's important also to point out that uh, when we genderize mental health we can we can go down another road and i don't think women are very good at talking about their feelings either i think they're very good at talking about surface stuff but the stuff that actually can often do the damage the, the more deeper layered stuff the stuff that kind of is difficult to get out because we, we don't know how to communicate it sometimes i think both men and women uh, struggle with that and I think, I think in terms of societal stigmas, yes, I think men, like you just have to look at the figures, uh, especially around suicide. And um, far, far more men uh, ultimately uh, die by suicide than, than women. And is that part of the stigma? It could be. Uh, and it's quite, it's quite, there's a lot of research out on that. But for me, from a point of view is the, the, the male, like when you look at things like toxic masculinity and the issues around men, men, aren't like men aren't as complex as they like to think they are they really aren't you break men down and you break the first thing you down is the ego and you look at the ego and how the ego works but the most important part of this conversation isn't the psychology of the of the male it's more sociology it's culture it's the culture we've created and if you look at the different cultures throughout the world we all have different men have, have different roles within that culture some are I, you know cultures that i wouldn't in terms of uh, in, agree with but that's not my place but i think sociology and culture has a far bigger conversation to be had than maybe the psychology because when you break any human down men man or woman uh, we all need the same things we all need to feel safe we all need to feel loved we all have physiological needs we all have self-fulfillment needs and if you look at the Maslow's hierarchy of needs which is what we learned in business studies in school i don't know why we did that in business studies but Maslow's hierarchy of needs still stands strong today it still it still makes utter sense today so yeah i think i think culture is a, is a huge element um especially within the sporting world but if you look at what's happening in sport now we're moving and it's really positive. And the reason it's positive, and I keep referring back to this, is because athletes do not realize the true capacity they have to communicate with young people. Young people absolutely worship them, um, and which is a great thing, but there's a great responsibility with that. And athletes are now starting to show that responsibility. But more important for me is they're showing vulnerability. They're not saying it's okay, not that they're actually going, I feel this too. That's where the power is. That is powerful. That is really powerful. So, uh, Niall, 
you have achieved so much and you're not even 40. I mean, it's just phenomenal. What drives you? Um, it's funny from a perspective of what drives me in terms of ambition um, in my career. Uh, I have different kind of metrics of what drives me. The first one is quite micro. Uh, my family uh, is a huge um, driver for me. I, I'm, I'm not a father. I'm not married. I'm, but I'm very close to my family. And I, they're very important to me. So I, I want to make sure that, and it's not my role, but I always want to make sure that my family are always safe and always have what they need. And they're the same with me. And I think that's an important grounding and foundation to have because when I was at my worst, they were that grounding. So, you know, I think in one weird way, I, I owe it to them. From a macro point of view, um, I look at culture and I look at policy and I look at mental health in Ireland and I, I realise that we're, we're in trouble here. And I've been, quite, in terms of mental health uh, campaigning, for five years, and although society is improving and we're moving in the right direction, we're moving in the wrong direction from a systematic point of view. Um, and I'm very passionate about figuring out how do we change that. And the only way to change that is to understand one thing. Mental health is not politically expedient. It does not get votes. And that, that is breaking my heart to say, but it's the truth. Politics is, um, I always look at one thing when I talk about politics. What's the bottom line of politics? And we can see it now with Brexit and we can see it across America. Power is the bottom line. Most politicians, and, and there's really good politicians with big hearts, but a lot of politicians, when it comes down to it, power is more important. And so with my organization, Others for Life, I said, why are we lobbying government? Why don't we lobby people? Because when we make this politically expedient, then people will vote for it. Recently in Ireland, in the local elections, there was a huge movement around the environment. And within a week, our politicians got scared because they saw there was votes in it, and they started writing policies around the environment. And they started implementing them. So I want to do the same. But more importantly, I want to do that internationally. And um, I know what I'm doing in terms of I, Ireland is a small country, but it's a small country that has a huge level of resonance with other countries around the world. Uh, there's no one in the world and there's no country in the world doing this right. Um, and I think rather than seeing that as a negative thing, that's a massive opportunity. And no individual, no group is going to do this on their own. So I, I want to help be the glue that brings people together. So in terms of mental health, that's my, well, in terms of the work I do, that's my driver. But I also want to educate people to let them know that if they are overwhelmed, if they're stressed, number one, it's not, it's not your fault. There's not some weird character flaw that you have. And secondly, there is things that you can do. And in the same way the mind can be weakened, it absolutely can be strengthened. So I want to empower people to realize that. That is huge. That's hugely powerful. That's fantastic. And we want to help you spread that word as a speaker. And in fact, we can, people can hear from listening to this or watching the video how eloquent you are, how beautifully you speak. How did you start speaking on uh, business stages? When did that come about? That was a mistake, uh, funnily enough. Um, I was speaking a lot in schools. And I decided with the school, school speaking, if you can hold an audience, if you can hold a group of 14 or 15 year olds, you can hold anybody. Um, and they will always be your toughest audience. And I remember the first place I spoke to was on a cycle. We cycled around Ireland to kind of bring the message uh, around mental health. And we, we cycled to every, nearly every town in the country. And we went to this one school and I spoke and some guy, young guy just walked up on stage um, in the middle of my talk. And he just, uh, he just came out and said, I'm so alone. He was 14. He goes, I haven't been able to understand what's in my head. Um, I haven't been able to deal with this. And he got a standing ovation from his class. Now, that to me, I said to him, if anybody wants a definition of what leadership is, that's leadership. Because I know there's people in this school that are in the same way, but he's decided to take it on. And I, I remember just realizing the power of speaking when you have an audience. And if you're able to communicate effectively, you have huge capacity to change things. And I remember one of my close friends, Connor Cusack, said, when you walk into a room and speak about this space, don't think of the thousand people there. Think of the one person that's gone home that is maybe in a better place or is maybe about to get help. Now, when I speak, I don't speak. It's not, everyone has this perception that it's going to be, oh my God. I remember doing a, an after dinner speech recently and I was, the guys were like, oh my God, he's going to be talking about mental health. God, that's the last thing we need after a few pints and a dinner. And they were falling off the chair laughing. 
throughout the whole talk because I don't come at it from the perspective people think. I also do not belittle it. I, 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 I understand it's a difficult subject, so I try to bring as much light to it and humor because it is funny. My, like your, your brain is a funny thing. And what happened with the corporate aspect was I was, I was asked to speak one day and um, I think it was Aviva. And they said, Jesus, I, my son heard you at school and he was absolutely blown away. I think you'd really do a good job with our, with our wellness week. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll, um, I'll give it a shot. So I went home and tried to write a speech. And I just remember thinking to myself, don't try to tell anyone else a story. Tell your own story. That's, that's all you've got to do here. Um, because people see through it. And that's what I did. And the minute I, I did that speech, um, I, I remember going, my God, this is having profound impact on people. And I didn't realize how much. And then I remember that uh, a CEO of one of the companies, after I spoke, got up and said, this is only one of my first four or five days into it. And he said, I gave up my family to get here. Um, my relationship with my family is completely skewed because of the fact that I put all my, my effort into getting to become the CEO of this company. I would not expect any of you to do the same and I would give back everything to get back that relationship with my family. And I just looked at him and I said, now that is leadership. The capacity to admit you're vulnerable is leadership. And CEOs have this weird thing in their heads that they think they have to be these beacons. And I've, act, I've worked with the YPO uh, where you, you have 40, 50 CEOs in a room and you're speaking to them in one go, they can't speak to anybody. They can't speak to the board and they can't speak to anyone, any of the, their employees. So it's a very lonely existence for a lot of them. And I remember saying, you do not get to that level it, it, without being stressed, without being overwhelmed, without being anxious, without many sleepless nights. So stop fooling yourself and stop fooling me. So that's how I kind of spoke about it. And then I, I spoke at leadership levels. I worked with like creative teams, um, uh, leadership teams, athletes. Um, I've spoken from, as I said, from every sector, from tech to, to, and it's interesting when you speak from different sectors, you start to notice the different needs of different sectors. Like the technology world is, you can notice there's a huge issue with attention control. They, uh, they, they can't maintain attention for longer than five or six minutes, you know, and, and that's the kind of world they're working in. Whereas maybe legal is quite overworked many hours and I, I recently wrote the graduate program for PwC so a lot of the the PwC have a graduate program where 180 people come in every year and only maybe 15 20 percent of them get jobs and the rest of them can that can be really difficult for someone just out of college who, who gets rejected from uh, an accountancy firm like PwC so I said to PwC if you're going to do that um, I understand you have to do that, but if you're going to do that, you should be running graduate programs to teach young people how to deal with this world and the stress and the overwhelm that does come with it. And PwC stood up to the plate, went, yeah. And I think they're one of the first to do it. So I wrote that program for them and I delivered it over four weeks. Um, so it's a very varied uh, background I have from workshops to keynotes to, to actually working one-on-ones with leaders um, and CEOs. And I absolutely love it. I think it's brilliant and I think it's very clear the, the benefits that a corporate and a business can get from bringing you in and normally I would ask my final question would be a very different one but I think for you and, and what I've learned so much from you today thank you I want to ask you something different from the norm um, if anybody's listened to this and is resonating with some of the things you're saying where would you say to them to go initially to get some help um, the first thing I would say is uh, we're all feeling this. Everybody's feeling this overwhelm at the moment. The world seems utterly fragmented. Um, we are consuming very difficult information constantly. Um, if you're living in the UK or America or Ireland, we're seeing a lot of difficult things. We're hearing a lot of difficult things. We've created this binary culture where there's a lot of people on one side and another side just shouting at each other. And it's overwhelming all of us. Um, and that's the first thing I would say. If you're feeling that, you're not alone on that. It's, 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 a pretty, uh, it's a pretty difficult couple of years that we've noticed. Um, and the first thing I would say is, is really start putting your attention on the things that do matter and the things that you do have control over. Uh, I have no control over anybody who has an opinion on that I disagree with. Um, I can't control that. I can control how I treat the person beside me. I can control how I treat the person in the, in the bar I go to tonight for, for dinner. And you have the ability to control your own actions. 
And that's the first place you start off. If you're struggling with stress, uh, you're, you've, you've been in a difficult place um, and you think you need help, you need as best you can to understand that that is, a, that is a, something we've all had, I've had to do. It has never in any way dictated my achievement. It's never dictated my, um, my ability to, to do the things I love. Um, and when I started dealing with it and when I started getting help, it utterly transcended everything. Um, so I know it's difficult to do that. I know it's a difficult thing to do, but we're all human. And I think over the last maybe many hundreds, hundreds of years even, we've, been, we've become dehumanized. Um, we, we've stopped being human. We've stopped interacting. We've stopped being kind. Kindness has become a radical act. When did that happen? So for me, in a point of view is that is you live in a world that isn't so bad no matter what you're consuming every day. You live in a world that does care. You live in a world where lots of people, I have the statistic that I, that I like to live by, 99% of people on earth are kind and lovely. But for, for some reason, we only hear about the 1% of horrible people all the time. And to give you a quick indication of why that is, if you go back to how our brains were built when we lived in caves, our brains were built with a negativity bias. So we put more emphasis on negative things, um, not because we're bad people, because that kept us alive when there were snakes behind bushes. So we became overly cautious about everything. And that one time there was a snake behind the bush, we were ready for him and we were gone. And that negativity bias was really powerful, powerful for us. But now that negativity bias has been turned on us by, by media agencies, by, by people looking for your attention. So if you look at all the stuff that we get shown in the news, Online, it's always negative stuff. If you look at most of the TV shows on Netflix, they're always about murders or drugs. And if you look at any headline in the paper, you're never going to see nice things. You'll never see a Twitter thread that's nice. It's generally, it's difficult stuff. It's not, it's not because we're bad people. It's because we have this negativity bias. And mindfulness, if you're aware that you have a negativity bias, you can make a choice of whether you want to get sucked in by that. So... The world isn't as bad as you think it is. Um, and if you really want to read a book that might change your life, read uh, Victor Franklin's Man's Search for Meaning. Um, that changed my life. And it, it, not in a kind of weird Oprah Winfrey perspective way, in a, in a completely profound, I couldn't speak for, for two days after reading it kind of way. It's a powerful book. I've read it too. Great advice. Niall, thank you so much for your time. Pleasure. Thanks a million.